We're coming to the closeout of our journey uh, on prayer, and um, this, this, today is going to be a bit of an honest journey as well. Uh, we've been through uh, four parts where we've followed the acronym PRAY, P-R-A-Y, pause, rejoice, ask, yield. And through this, we would be tempted to say and think, well, prayer is easy, prayer is, you know, just follow that and you'll be fine. But there, we need to come up to this, this idea at some point in our lives about unanswered prayer. What do we do when God doesn't answer our prayers? What do we do when it seems like God is so far away from us? What do we do? You know, I, I remember growing up, and I'm glad that God hasn't answered all of my prayers in life. You can, you can imagine when you go on holiday, right, what's the thing you do? You, you pray for, for beautiful weather, right? And um, you pray for beautiful weather in Queensland at the beach. If all of us who, who ever went on holiday prayed for beautiful weather, it would never rain. And the farmers in our church would be saying, well, where's God in all of this? So sometimes it's good our prayers are not answered. I remember a little story when I was still at high school and, and uh, I had a friend who was also a Christian and we were talking to another friend of ours who was an atheist and I, I still think he's an atheist. I haven't heard from him for many years. Uh, I'm trusting he's not, but he may still be. But we were, we were talking to him and having a debate, you know, how you go with this and what do you believe, what do we believe? And it was, a, you know, it was getting a bit pointed at one particular point, right? So I said to my Christian friend, I said, you know what I'm going to do? And we, my, the other person was standing right there, this atheist friend. I said, I'm going to pray right now that God will strike him with lightning. <laughs> and then he will know that God is alive. I'm not quite sure how you'd know because he'd be dead. But um, and my friend said, no, no, no. And even if I prayed that prayer, I'm sure God wouldn't have answered that prayer, right? Because he's interested in this other person. So sometimes God not answering our prayers is a good thing. But let's be honest, many of us have journeyed, and even this week some of you are journeying with, with tough prayers. You're praying prayers which are good prayers. You're praying for a friend or, or somebody who's, who's, who's ill, and you're saying, God, would you hear my prayer? Perhaps you prayed in the past for, for somebody, and, and that person passed away. Or perhaps you prayed for a change in your situation which would have brought good things into your life. Perhaps a job, a better job, or, or perhaps a relationship that was healthy. Um, or, or perhaps for, for violence in your family to end. And that wasn't answered. And so we have this real sense when sometimes our prayers seem to be bouncing up against the ceiling. They're just not answered. <clears throat> and we bump up against this question. And it's a big question. The question is, if God is all-loving, and if God is all-powerful, and if God is all-knowing, why doesn't he do something about this? Why doesn't he step in and take away the suffering in the world? <clears throat> why doesn't he change my situation? Because if he's all-loving and not all-powerful, well, it's not really the type of God I want to serve. And if he's all-powerful, but he doesn't really care about me, I also don't really want to follow him. And so we bump up against this question when our prayers are not answered. Is God loving and is he powerful? And does he care about me? It's here the prayer takes on a bit of an honesty. It's here the prayer, we sometimes believe prayer is like, you know, sailing out in your, in your little dinghy out on a wide bay. Beautiful days. Just beautiful sunlight. Everything is perfect. The fish are biting. We think prayer is like that. But prayer is more often like an ordinary day where the wind is a little bit fickle, where the sun is baking down on you, where the midges are out and, and it's not quite perfect. And sometimes life is like a stormy day when it seems like the water is, is coming into your boat, into your dinghy, and it seems like it's about to capsize, and you're not sure where to turn, where to go from here, much like we heard in that very personal story this morning. When life seems to crowd in on you, and God seems to be distant, how do we answer this? I'm so grateful this morning that I don't have to come and give you the answer to this big question on my own. Because I wrestle with these questions too. I'm grateful that there's a friend, a good friend, a trusted friend, a friend who cares, who will help us go in the right direction. 
This morning we're going to journey with Jesus and his journey into prayer and unanswered prayer. And as we journey with Jesus and see and get a look into his prayer life in a moment when the prayer he would have preferred, God didn't, the Father didn't answer that. And we trust that as we journey through this in honesty, that we will begin to draw strength and hope in those moments when it doesn't seem like God is there. Mark 14, verse 32. Just to give you the context, this is Thursday night. This is after we call the Passover feast. Jesus, by Friday morning, he would be on the cross. He's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. So they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Let's just pause there for a moment. There's something going on here. He's in Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a garden, a garden where, where olive trees were planted. And the word Gethsemane means the press, the press of oils. And I get into my sense a little bit of drama going on here. This place where Jesus is going to be pressed. This garden where he's journeying deeply in his own requests of the Father. We'll read on. Verse 34, he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. He's saying this to Peter, James, and John. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said, stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell down to the ground and prayed, look what he's praying, that if it is possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he says, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Jesus is here at this place where he's saying this cup, this cup which, which refers, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's from the Old Testament. It talks about God's judgment. It talks about God, God judging all the evil and sin and every evil thing that we've ever done that has ever been done in this world. It's talking about God judging that. And Jesus is saying, Father, take this cup from me. He's in this moment when it's so deep. And this dreadful sorrow has come over him. That word, the words that we've read there, they talk about Jesus actually being stunned. Stunned by what he was facing. And somebody just on Monday, it was also a person I'm journeying with, he also says he's an atheist. He asked me the question, he said, surely if Jesus knew everything, that Jesus was the Son of God and knew everything, and he knew he was going to die and rise again a few days later, why was he so troubled? Here's the answer that I gave him, and I believe the answer that is biblical. Jesus, in that moment, his relationship had been so close to that father. In that moment, he actually saw the depth of what he was going to carry on him. The depth of hell that he was going to take on him. It was exposed, in a way, in front of him. And he journeys into that and the sense of desolation that was going to start there and end on the cross when he said, finally, my Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The sense of desolation which he had never known was an utter horror for him. He, he got to the point where there was this deep hole that he was in. Men and women have faced challenges in life before. Like giving up their life for a good cause. But here the very Son of God is in that moment realizing what he's got to go through. Let's read on. As C.S. Lewis says, In Gethsemane, the holiest of all petitioners, in other words, Jesus, prayed three times that a certain cup might pass from him. It did not. After that, the idea that prayer is recommended to us as a sort of infallible gimmick may be dismissed. In other words, he's saying that even if the Son of God prayed three times and said, God, if it's possible, take this cup from me, and the Father said, no, then we can dismiss the idea that prayer is like just putting 50 cents or a dollar into a slot machine and out comes whatever you're buying. 
There is these moments when prayer is not answered in the way that we would prefer. See, C.S. Lewis had journeyed through this himself, his wife, and he, got mar- he was an atheist and he got, became a Christian and he got married really late in life. And then his wife got cancer and died and he journeyed through that. And he had to come to realize that in those moments that God can surprise us with his joy. That prayer sometimes is not easy, especially when we're being honest. So grateful about Vim's story this morning, that sense of honesty, just where he was at. Somebody asked him and he, and he responded with honesty. Reading further, verse 35. Just see what Jesus says here now. How did Jesus journey through this? How did Jesus get through unanswered prayer? Going a little further, Father, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. We see his humanity. We see his honesty. But we see him also holding on to two things. Both, first of all, that God does love him. Abba, Father. It's both the Hebrew and the Greek. The, the New Testament is in Greek. But both of those words are there, which is unusual. He says, God, you're my, you're my daddy in this moment. You're my father. You care about me. You're, you're all loving. We're tempted to think God's not all loving. Jesus says you are are all loving, even though I don't feel like it right now. Then he says, everything is possible for you. You are all powerful. He's saying, yeah, he's saying, your father, I, can, I've, I know I need to go to the cross, but this, is there some other way to go around this, having to take on this cup, this depth of desolation? Is that really what I need to do? When your prayers are unanswered, Hold on to God's love and God's power. I might say in that moment, you don't feel like doing that. I might say in that moment, it's not an easy step to take. But we are encouraged that that's exactly what Jesus did. He held on to God's love and God's power, even when it seemed like God was, the Father wasn't there and didn't care. So how did Jesus deal with this? How did he keep going? How did he keep going forward? And look what he pivots to in his prayer. Verse 36, the second part of it, he says, Yet not my will, but what you will. There's a sense that prayer in these desperate moments doesn't drive us away from God. It drives us to God. And we would say, God, I don't understand this, but I'm trusting you. Not my will, but yours be done. It's called the prayer of relinquishment. The word relinquish means to surrender, to say, God, I give up. Not my will, but yours be done. It's an honest prayer. It's a prayer in a moment when God steps in. See, our culture, friends, and we are tempted to, live, to believe and step into this. We are influenced by our culture. It's like asking a fish what is water like, and a fish won't be able to tell you. We are steeped in our culture, and there's something in our culture which is different to how it was 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. Our culture is pivoted from an ethic of what is right, we will do it, we will do it even if it's hard, we, we, we will, we, if we commit to something, we will do it. Our culture has changed. Our culture says right now that the most important thing is your individual freedom and happiness. Our culture says not your will be done, our culture says my will be done. And because we're in this, we don't seem to question it. Our culture says that the highest good is your individual freedom and happiness, and that traditions and regulations and social ties that restrict our freedom and happiness need to be dissolved, and we need to find happiness somewhere else. If this person doesn't please me, I'll dissolve that commitment I've made to them in marriage and find another person who will make me happy. For example, that's what we do. 
our ethics have become prioritized around this quest for freedom and happiness. See, in the garden, Jesus prayed, your will be done. In the garden, Jesus' prayers were not answered because something greater was at stake. The destiny of every human being. Hanging in the balance there, he could have said, I'm not going to do this. He had the choice. Yes, he was the son of God, but yes, he was human. He was being sorely tested here. We don't know this from the scriptures, but I can assume the devil was right there. His prayers were not answered for you and I. But hung in the balance in the moment is the will of God for you and I. That you and I in that moment, as he surrenders to the Father, as he finds that he's being abandoned by the Father, that we might then be embraced by the Father. That in that moment when his prayers are not answered, our ultimate prayers, does God care about me? Does God love me? Our ultimate prayers will be answered. His are not answered so that ours can be answered. The will of God, your will be done. Pete Gregg in his book, and we're following this, we've been doing it, that's the P-R-A-Y, pause, rejoice, ask, and yield, comes from his book, and a couple of, uh, about 30 of us are journeying on Wednesday nights through a Nate Pod video series, and some of you in your life groups are doing that too. In his book, um, Prayer, on Prayer, um, he says this, he says, most of our unanswered prayers can be attributed either to God's will, God's word, or God's war. Let me explain that. In this moment, it was God's will, the Father's will, that Jesus suffer. It was God's will that Jesus goes through that. And sometimes the things that we want for our lives, God can see a greater good. Doesn't answer all of our prayers, doesn't answer all of the unanswered prayers, but sometimes God sees something bigger, which is at stake, God's will. What about God's world? We live in a world, friends, where we are subject to the laws of nature. When our culture said, our will be done, not yours, in Eden, the world was plunged into brokenness. We suffer, we have illnesses, we die, we struggle, we struggle at work, in childbirth, those are all from Genesis. And so we live in this world where God doesn't necessarily step in to take that away. Sometimes he does, those are called miracles, but generally allows the laws of nature to carry on. We will get older and pass away at one point if Jesus doesn't come back. We are subject to that. So this is God's world. Does God intervene at times? Yes, he can, but we are in his world. And then God's war. We are in a war, friends. Let's not forget that the enemy comes against us. The enemy would want to defeat God's purposes on earth. And we see this so beautifully in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel. What had happened there, the king Nebuchadnezzar, the, the whole nation of Israel was, was in exile, and King Nebuchadnezzar had set up this big, gold, this big statue, and everybody had to worship it. Instead of worship God, they had to worship this statue. And if they didn't, they would be thrown into the fiery furnace. And so they blow the trumpets, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Abednego don't bend their knee. And they blow the trumpets again, and they don't. So eventually the king says, okay, we're going to throw you into the fiery furnace. This is what they say to him in Daniel 3, 16 to 19. It's not on the screen. I'll just read it. They say to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the, into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. There was a war on was a war on for the people of God, but this is what they say now. But even if it does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And Jesus, or an angel, we believe Jesus, steps into that fire with them. There's a war on, my friends. And we face that temptation. We face that pressure. We face an enemy who's directly set against our prayers being answered. For example, if you're praying for somebody in your family to follow Jesus and, and know Jesus, the enemy is dead set against that. He's dead set against that person hearing, understanding, 
It's like the, the parable of the sower. It's like there's the pathway, which is hard, and the, the seeds just get pecked up, and they don't get, they don't get, they don't fruit, they don't, they don't uh, come up and, and give more wheat. The enemy's against us. God's world, God's will, God's war. But I want to say, as we head toward a close here, that Jesus steps into that fire. We believe Jesus. It may not have been, but it talks about God being present with them. And in the Old Testament, whenever we see God showing up, we believe that to be Jesus, a pre-incarnate Jesus. Is that sometimes people bow down to that person and worship, and an angel would never let that happen. But here God is with them in some way in this fiery furnace. Just like God was with them in that furnace, my friend, I want to say so Jesus steps into your world and my world to be with us. The prayers he prayed... In Gethsemane, they were not answered. The Father didn't answer it so that Jesus can step into your world. That the Father can know you. That you can be drawn into a relationship with Him. God has not left you as an orphan. Because Jesus' prayers were not answered, we are convinced that God loves us. Because Jesus' prayers were not answered, we know God is with us even when life doesn't make sense. Because Jesus' prayers were not answered and he died and rose again, he will one day undo all the evil and suffering in this world. Can somebody say hallelujah? Friends, one day our prayers will be answered. One day our prayers for every good thing we've ever, ever wanted to know will be answered. Just not yet, mostly. Sometimes God does in his mercy, but just not yet. Because he has a greater purpose afoot. <clears throat> this is what the Bible says in Romans 8, 28 and 29. Unlike our world who is after happiness, God is after something else for you and I. It says this in Romans 8, 28 and 29. We know verse 28 really well, but we forget to read verse 29. For we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. So in other words, whatever we go through, God can work it out for good. We have been called according to his purpose. Here's the next part. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You see, friends, God's loving will for you is not that you are happy every day, but that every day you become more like Jesus. God's will for you is not that you are happy every day, but that every day you become more like Jesus. And so the life we go through, the honest life, the sometimes the struggling struggles of life, those are the moments that God shapes us Yes, it's human nature, and I do this too. We buck and scream and say, no, God, no, God. But whatever we're going through, he's using it to shape us. Does that mean that God says to us that, that God ordains evil to happen in this world? No, but evil is happening, and he's allowing it to happen for a time because he's allowing it to shape us. God wants you to become more like Jesus. So coming back to this prayer of relinquishment where we say, God, I don't understand your will, not mine. Francois Fenelon says it in this way, in this prayer. Lord, I do not know what to ask of you. Only you know what I need. I simply present myself to you. I open my heart to you. I have no other desire than to accomplish your will. Teach me to pray. Amen. As we draw the threads to a close, Jesus has taught us as he's journeyed with us, as he steps into this journey with us, from his life we learn, and he not only shows us the way, but he makes this possible. Firstly, be honest with where you're at. Be honest with where you're at. 
Secondly, learn to surrender to God. Pray not my will, but yours be done. And thirdly, whatever you do, hold on to God's love and to God's power. Jesus has stepped into the fire with you and I. He died so that that could be made possible. He steps in to be with us, to bring us to the Father. He's with us today. I know I haven't answered all the reasons why doesn't God answer prayer. There are other reasons. Sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes it just doesn't, we can't answer that. But I trust that this would at least have given you some direction to know that Jesus is journeying with you in your moment. He knows what's in your future. He knows what's coming. You can trust him. In this age of anxiety, when we're not sure what's happening in our future, he's there, journeying, calling you toward the future, walking beside you, taking you forward, shaping you to be more like him. That's his ultimate goal. He wants you to become more like him, to bring glory to the Father. And we trust that in this life, God will spare us from suffering a trial. We hope he will, but if he doesn't, we will still trust him. There's still hope in him. I'm going to pray for you right now. And as I pray, I want to remind you that in that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross, Jesus was abandoned so that you might be embraced. I want to pray that as we know, as we come to God, that he would embrace you even now. I'm going to read you a scripture. Let's pray together. Father, your word says in Romans 15, 13, there's this powerful, powerful scripture that I pray over us and over our hearts this morning. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, this morning we pray in these precious moments, Lord, when we grapple with unanswered prayer, we grapple with suffering in this world, in our own lives, in our families. We don't get this, Lord. But we pray and I pray that our the pressure we're under will push us closer to you, not away from you. Might you give us the strength not to question your love and your power and what you know about us. Lord, in these moments, we simply pray, your will be done, not mine, not ours. pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come in and deeply encourage us. Apply what Jesus has done in that garden and on the cross and in his death and resurrection. Apply that to our hearts today. Might there be a peace in our hearts that settles, which we can't explain. Might there be a hope that rises up in us that gives us direction. Might there be a joy in the middle of difficulty. Might there be a joy in the middle of the mundane. We pray, Lord, lead us, show us. Give us a sense of your presence, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.